Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ben Thomas, and I'm with UST Training, and today's webinar is called Confused About Leak Test Requirements for Underground Storage Tanks. I want to welcome uh, everyone here today. We've been chatting with people before we got started, and wow, we've got everything from United Kingdom joining us today at the end of the day, all the way to the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, the farthest Western uh, US territory, and it's almost four in the morning out there. Thank you again for everyone getting up early out there and uh, joining us. I'm excited to have this presentation today. Um, again, my name is Ben Thomas. I'm with UST Training. I've been in the underground petroleum storage tank business a long time. I'll talk about that in a minute. And my trusty helper and good friend, Matt McDowell, is uh, going to be helping us. Matt, can you a quick introduction? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm Matt McDowell and uh, also with USD Training and uh, just going to be helping Ben uh, answer questions and keep an eye on uh, the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, we've, uh, yeah, we've had a lively group this morning already. So looking forward to hearing people's questions. Great. And then, um, so today's webinar is going to be, uh, the goal is really is to make everyone uh, tank savvy. We, we like to use this term. It's not just kind of a um, uh, getting through the day with your underground storage tank compliance, you know, not leaking, not in fine, uh, not, not shut down, but we really want to make operators who care about kind of the, 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 the big and the little picture of USTs, uh, we want to help you get there. And so I'm really excited to be here today. And I think with that, I'm just going to, I'm just going to jump in just real quick about me. Uh, I climbed into my first underground storage tank excavation pit in 1986 in Vermont. And so I've been a, a UST inspector uh, early on in the game. I actually predate the federal rules. I'm a um, basically a UST inspector first and then became a consultant and trainer afterwards. Pardon me, for the last 20 years, I've been able to uh, provide UST operator training to people all over the country. And I guess my one claim to fame in life, if I have to have one, is that I've trained more UST operators and for longer than pretty much anyone else in the USA. And that's a uh, tens of thousands of class AB operators, almost three quarters of a million class C operators. We're super excited to have such a, a big influence. And more, more and more, I go visit someone at a gas station. There's our you know, certificate hanging above the tank gauge above the wall. So we're excited to have everyone here today and maybe do a bit more of a deeper dive and cover some of the basics about UST compliance. Um, I am the author and my friend Matt has been instrumental in getting the videos uh, shot and produced of the Tank Savvy Minute video on YouTube. So if you haven't seen those videos, feel free to come check them out. We also are members of the Petroleum Equipment Institute, uh, Society for Independent Gasoline Marketers Association, and we're also members of a number of state petroleum marketer associations. So this training all came about because um, I was doing live training, and when I would explain all the all the leak test rules, at the end of the day, we'd kind of do a recap, and I kept on getting these blank looks. It's like, I think I've been explaining this pretty well, but people don't know the difference between CSLD and non-CSLD, pressure tests versus non-pressure tests. And so I thought to make it easier on folks to be able to explain stuff, hopefully in simple enough terms, so that when you all these terms get thrown at you, kind of know what it is we're even talking about. And so. Operator training laws do require you to know about a number of different leak tests. There's a 0.1 gallon per hour leak test, a really small leak. There's a 0.2 a gallon per hour leak test. That's a bit more common. There's a three gallon per hour leak test. So like, what is the difference and where are these leaks and how do they work? And let's try to figure all that out. I know from personal experience, it can be confusing because there's so many diff different types of leak tests out there. There's different tests. There's different test locations, there's different test equipment, and there's different leak rates. Um, I want to think of this as an explanation of what I wish I would have had when I started in the biz. When I had the biz, I had to read the regs and kind of like imagine what all this sort of stuff is. And at the very beginning, I'd never really been around underground storage tanks. So I'm hoping to basically provide you with a picture that I guess I, I wish I would have had back in 1986. We can make it easy. We can learn about each test, what the test is where the test occurs, what device does the test, and what size leak we are looking for. And some leaks are yes, no, uh, red light, green light. Some are gallons per hour. And so I'm, try I'm not going to use too many acronyms here. Uh, UST, underground storage tank, we probably all know what that is. GPH is gallons per hour. And that is the typically the, unit, the units by which most leak tests are measured. 
And if we have any technicians on the line, if I'm kind of oversimplifying things, know that I'm not an engineer, I'm not a field tester, but I try to be a translator to bridge between what the tester does and what the operator, or for that matter, the inspector needs to know. So if we are looking for a leak inside the tank, is our underground petroleum storage tank leaking, right? The white is air and the kind of yellow beige is fuel. A lot of tanks have the requirement of looking for a leak of 0 0.2 gallons per hour. So what does that mean and how does it work? You have an automatic tank gauge, which measures uh, loss of fuel inside the tank at certain intervals. And so an automatic tank gauge test of 0 0.2 gallons per hour, you measure the change in volume of fuel over time. You shut down the site. You don't put fuel in, you don't pump fuel out. You have a known amount of fuel in the tank and you basically shut everything down and then you watch that level. And so if this level basically remains constant over the test interval, whether it's two or four or eight hours, that is your leak test. And so you start with a volume, you end with a volume. Oh, my cursor, get over here. And then um, one, once, um, once that change is measured, it calculates it. And if the change is, what I'll just say kind of insignificant, and if you're not leaking more than 0 0.2 gallons per hour, then the tank is declared tight. Now there are two different types of tests. Some are testing periodically, meaning you shut down the tank and you wait two to four, eight hours, and then you come up with a leak test. But there are these things called continuous testing. And if you ever see a test printout that says CSLD, continuous statistical leak detection, or SCALD, uh, statistical continuous something something leak detection, that means you were always testing in between customers. Normally in the old days, you'd have to shut down the tank. Nothing gets pumped in, nothing gets pumped out because you can't have fuel movement during a leak test. You have to have what's called quiet time. And so an automatic tank gauge absolutely requires quiet time. Again, now this is only for the inner tank. If you have a double wall tank, we're looking for a leak inside the tank based on volume change over time. And so Continuous testing is better because what's happening is that you're testing in between every single customer. And so the customer leaves, it's quiet, system turns on, starts doing a little bit of a leak test. Customer comes in, turns on the pump, the test stops. Customer fills up the car, customer leaves, the test continues. And so with continuous testing, again, CSLD testing, you're always testing when you're not pumping. So you get a better test because you're testing more often under more conditions. A periodic test is fine, but um, it does take a while to do it. So you've got a 0 0.2 gallon per hour test and is looking for a change in volume over time. And if it's a change in volume equivalent to greater than 0 0.2 gallons per hour, a leak is declared. And your leak rate is basically 0 0.2 gallons per hour. So your automatic tank gauge finds a leak. If the tank is leaking more than 0 0.2 gallons per hour, a leak is declared and you as the operator have to respond to a suspected release. So that's one test method. If you have a double wall tank, so you've got an inner tank and an outer tank and this little teeny white gap all the way around the tank is what's called the interstitial space. And that is an area that we monitor. We don't care how much fuel is in the tank. It can be a little bit of fuel, it can be a, a, a lot of fuel because we're, this is not a volumetric test. If you're looking for a leak in between the inner and the outer tank, any detectable change is considered a leak. And I'll explain what that is in a second here. This is called tank interstitial monitoring. Interstitial means in between. We don't care about what's happening inside the tank because if the conditions um, are unchanged in the interstitial space and the tank is declared tight. This is literally a red light, green light kind of test. You know, red, green light, good, no leak, red light, bad, maybe a leak. Now, some of your tanks have dry interstices. So imagine a kind of a, an air sleeve around the double wall tank. That is our dry interstice. So it stands to reason if it's dry, it's not leaking. If it's wet, it could be leaking. The presence of liquid in the interstitial space could be a, a leak. 
Now it's possible the technician didn't put the cap on after they did their last inspection and it rained a whole bunch. We've had a lot of rain here in Seattle this last couple of weeks. Uh, so it's possible rainwater got into the interstitial space, hit the sensor. It looks like it's a leak but it's actually a false alarm. You still need to investigate that as a suspected release. So again, tank interstitial monitoring looks for the presence of liquid in the interstice. If there's presence of the liquid, it is a suspected release. It's possible the inner chamber of the tank is leaking into the outer chamber of the tank. And a leak is basically any amount. If it's, if it's wet, it's contaminated or leaking. And if it's dry, there's no leak. Now, if you were doing a continuous leak test on the inside of the tank, what we talked about a moment ago, that 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak, but your interstice was dry, then it could have been a false alarm for the periodic test. So maybe we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So the automatic tank gauge with the interstitial tank sensor finds a leak. Again, this little gray area here, it's a dry interstice. And if the sensor detects any sort of liquid, that is a suspected release. If you have double wall, ATG, interstitial tank sensor, it will find the leak. Now, I will say a number of folks I know use the uh, periodic or CSLD 0 0.2 gallon per hour test inside the tank, and they use the interstitial monitoring test on the outside of the tank. And so you can kind of mix and match these things. You do need to declare which method you're using as your primary method. And if your tank was installed after a certain date, you're gonna to have to use this method. In fact, at some point in the future, this, the, the 0 0.2 test is probably gonna go away because every single tank in the nation will be double wall interstitial. And once you go to double wall interstitial, you're kind of committed to using this method. That's the bad news. The good news is it's actually a better method because there's less um, things that can mess up the test result. If you're looking for a leak in between the inner and outer tank, there is another interstitial monitoring method that is the wet interstice. So this area between the inner and the outer tank is not air dry. It's actually full of a hydraulic liquid. And so imagine a reservoir, come on. Imagine a reservoir of uh, liquid in the interstitial chamber. And so if that chamber level stays static and the interstitial space is full of a liquid and it's basically not moving, going up or down, the tank is tight. But if your brine level starts dropping, then something's going on. If your brine level starts going up, maybe you're gaining fuel because you have a leak on the inside of the tank. If the brine level is dropping, you probably have a leak on the outer side of the tank. And so this is a interstitial monitoring method. And it's not wet is bad, dry is good. It's that you have a known volume of liquid in the interstice. And if that level changes, you have a suspected release. A leak is any change in the chamber level of the brine saltwater interstitial solution. So just like before, the tank interstitial sensor finds the leak. Again, you have a liquid level and if it drops, you've got a potential leak on your hands. Any one of these conditions that gives you an alarm that says it's a leak, you must investigate that as a suspected release. You can't just say, oh yeah, it rained last Thursday and it's probably this or it's probably that. If you have a interstitial sensor indicating an alarm, you have to investigate that as a suspected release. It could be a false alarm, but it could be a big leaker. Now, if you have double wall piping, right? We have a, a tank a turbine, submersible turbine sump here double wall piping feeding into the system. So if you're looking for a leak at the low point between the inner and the outer pipe, i.e. the sump, any liquid in the interstitial space is a suspected release. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. We're calling this uh, piping interstitial monitoring. We've left the tank altogether. What we're concerned about here is whether this pipe is leaking and filling up this containment sump to the level of triggering an alarm for which you would then have to investigate as a suspected release. The presence of liquid in the sump is a suspected release. A lot of operators don't know this. A lot of operators um, uh, uh, routinely get liquid in their sumps. My friends out in, all the way out in the island of Tinian, it rains a lot out there, right? So maybe there's rainwater coming in and filling up the sump and triggering your alarm, but maybe there's a leak in the line because the leak has drained down 
downstream, filled up the sump and then triggered the alarm. So again, the presence of liquid in the sump is a suspected release. It could be a leak. Any liquid in the containment sump is an indication of a suspected release. You have a containment sump, it's full of fuel. You've got our containment area, have our piping, we have our interstitial monitor, have a bunch of liquid in there. It kind of looks like gasoline to me. Um, we do have a leak detector, but we have the presence of liquid in the sump. It is a suspected release. Likewise, my friend's from Wisconsin. I think this is a Wisconsin picture, a containment sump full of fuel with a sump sensor. It looks like a interstitial leak to me. So here the tank interstitial pipe sensor finds a leak. And when I say tank or ATG, what I mean is that your tank monitor is gonna be looking for these leaks. So these sensors are actually attached to your, your Vita root, your Incom, whatever tank gauge you have. And so this wire here and this wire here sends a signal off to the tank gauge to let you know the conditions in the sump. That way you don't have to open up the lid constantly and try to imagine what's happening down there. Again, we're back to that case of dry is good and wet is bad. And it could be rainwater, but it could be a suspected release. This is a uh, January, this picture was taken in a January. Maybe it's a bunch of snow melt that happened, but again, it could be a suspected release and must be investigated. Everything we've talked about so far has to do with uh, static fuel. We got fuel sitting in the, uh, the tank. You have maybe fuel sitting in the tank top sump. You have liquid not under pressure sitting in the interstitial space. We're gonna move out a little bit. If you have a gas station or a site with a pressurized piping from here all the way up to your dispenser, the line is under pressure. And so we're, not, we're now not looking at static conditions. This is a under pressure line. Think of it as a garden hose, right? You're, you've, the hose is on, but the nozzle is you know, not activated yet. That line is energized. And so if there's a leak in the system, you should see a little, a little spray coming out of it. State and federal law requires if you have pressurized line at a minimum, you have to look for a three gallon per hour leak. This little leak detector here is looking for a zero point, no, I'm sorry, a 3.0 gallon per hour leak. And the, the backstory from what I've heard over the years is that EPA, when they wrote the rules in the late eighties, they talked to the manufacturers and they said, how big a leak can your leak detector find? And the manufacturers at the time said three gallons per hour. And so that's been the standard ever since 1988. If your line is leaking greater than three gallons per hour, this leak detector will tell you that. In this case, it is a mechanical line leak detector. It's a mechanical device. It's not attached to the tank gauge. It doesn't talk to the tank gauge. It is a mechanical device looking for bad line pressure. If the line pressure, once you authorize the pump, is not energizing up to its full level, it gives you an indication of a big leak. A three gallon per hour leak is a giant leak. You can lose thousands of gallons of fuel into the ground with a three gallon per hour leak. So again, this is a pressure sensor. The pump gets turned on, the fuel gets energized, it passes through the leak detector. If from here on up to the end, it can't hold steady pressure, it will restrict flow. If you've taken my training before, you might remember the title of it being slow flow. And so a leak rate is three gallons per hour. This is a giant leak, right? And so you as an operator or an inspector, if you have a mechanical line leak detector, you just need to know that it is a looking for a three gallon per hour leak. And the indication is that the pump is now running really, really, really slow. The customer, instead of getting 10 gallons a minute, is now getting three gallons a minute and they get frustrated and they talk to the clerk and cashier and they talk to the manager and they call the service provider and on and on it goes. And so the only thing this device is meant to do is meant to frustrate someone enough to tell someone to then go make a call. So it's, it's kind of old school. It's not a very efficient way to go, but we have plenty of mechanical line leak detectors out there. All the operators I've talked to over the years didn't really understand that slow flow meant a suspected release. And it could be something else. Maybe your filter is clogged. Maybe, um, Maybe there's some problem with the line, maybe it, that it's not a leak, but it also could be a leak. So what I want to say, though, you have a three gallon per hour leak test and you want to be able to find that three gallon per hour leak. If you have a mechanical line leak detector, it finds a three gallon per hour leak by giving the operator slow flow conditions. And if, if you ignore those slow flow, yeah, you know, that pump, it's always just really slow. 
<laughs> that doesn't really cut it, right? You have to be able to understand what that means. I was in Puerto Rico once years ago. I talked to a third generation gas station owner, very proud his grandpa built the business. Like no one ever told him that a, a slow flow meant a suspected release. So please, uh, please consider that going forward. Now there is also another device for doing line pressure tests. And so if you're looking for a leak inside the inner pressure pipe, that's this little section here, you have a device that is an electronic line leak detector looking for a three and a 0.2 and possibly a 0.1 gallon per hour leak. And so this is an electronic device. Instead of having a mechanical leak detector, you have an electronic line leak detector. And the first test it's gonna do is, is it leaking more than three gallons per hour? No, nope, everything is fine. And so if it's quiet enough, it starts running a 0.2 gallon per hour leak test. And if it's really quiet, it'll run a 0.1 gallon per hour leak test. So your electronic line leak detector does big, little, and tiny leaks. However, they can all be programmed or decomprobed, deprogrammed to run not all three tests. So you could have one, two, three, you could have one, two, you could just have one. You have to check with your settings to see what it's programmed to do. Again, our electronic line leak detector looks for a leak in the line, a pressurized leak in the line of three, 4.2 or 0.1 gallons per hour, big, little, tiny leak. It can find a three gallon per hour leak. And if it's quiet, it'll find a, a 0.2 gallon per hour leak. And if it's really quiet, it'll find a 0.1 gallon per hour leak. Now the benefit of an electronic line leak detector is that it gives you no flow. The leak detector goes, uh, sorry, you're done. It's gonna send a signal to the turbine. It's gonna shut down the power to the dispenser, and now the customer can't get fuel. If you have no flow, and you go back to your tank gauge, and it'll say something like PLLD shutdown alarm, that means you've maybe got a leak in the line of a three or a 0.2 or a 0.1. So the, the benefit of electronic line leak detector, it talks to your tank gauge, it gives you a signal, and it shuts everything down. And so you physically cannot pump fuel until the problem is addressed. It's probably a superior method from kind of a psychological behavioral method because it prevents you from doing what you want to do, i.e. sell or use gas until the problem is corrected. Your electronic line leak detector, and that's your little device here threaded into your turbine and this wire allows the tank monitor to control the electronic line leak detector. The electronic line leak detector programmed to the ATG, your automatic tank gauge, finds the leak. Now there's another way to look for leaks and it is a line pressure test. You're looking for a leak from here, well, yeah, from here all the way to the dispenser. And that is a 0.1 gallon per hour leak. That is where the technician, your line tightness tester certified by the manufacturer comes in and performs a line tightness test. What they do is they isolate, they valve off the line, they overpressure this line from the dispenser on back to here they overpressure the line. Basically imagine blowing up a balloon to see, or like a, a camping air mattress. And if you're losing air, it's got a leak in the line. And so this is, this is an overpressurization test. They overpressurize the line just to make sure it holds. One and a half times operating pressure is the minimum standard. If it can't hold pressure, there is a 0.1 gallon per hour leak in the line. This is a, an option that some people have to do because they don't have a second method of leak detection and some do optionally. I know some companies, they do electronic line leak detectors and double wall piping and a line tightness test just to be safe. Because what we've learned, ladies and gentlemen, over the years is that more the, the leak is way more likely to happen from the piping than the tank. About one in 10 times, the tank is actually the leaker. It's almost always here or here at the fittings or below the dispenser. So if you want to kind of think about this from a risk perspective, the riskiest thing you have with a pressurized line system is the piping because nine times out of 10, that's where the leak's going to be. And so we've got a leak threshold of 0 0.1 gallons per hour. In this case, one, one, one can of Coke. Your leak rate is 0 0.1 gallons per hour. So Frank, the tester here, our buddy from Wisconsin, tests the system finds a leak of 0.1 gallons per hour. I just wanna take a quick moment here. Uh, 
Frank is standing next to my, my, my dear friend, Steve uh, Papora, who passed away a couple of years ago, the man on the right here. He was uh, instrumental in uh, motivating people to be good operators out there. Uh, he was a close friend of mine. I'm kind of trying to carry the torch that Steve would have carried about getting people passionate about UST systems. Steve's dad was one of the inventors of the line tightness test back in the 70s. And so his family's got a great lineage with this business. So just a quick, uh, quick thank you to Steve for all the work you did over the years. So let's summarize stuff. So you've got a single or a double wall tank and you want a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak test. The automatic tank gauge does the device. It looks for the leak inside the tank and it gives you a leak test result of 0 0.2 gallons per hour. If you have a double wall tank, <clears throat> you're looking for a leak in between the inner and the outer tank. We don't care about the tank itself per se. We don't care about the liquid in the tank. We care about whether the interstitial space is in good shape, whether it can be wet or dry. With double wall piping, you can also have uh, uh, interstitial monitoring. You can look for any amount of leak in between the inner and outer wall of the pipe, which normally uh, consolidates down at the containment sump, the low point in the system. Your piping sump sensor is the thing that looks for the leak in the line. If you have pressurized lines and you have a mechanical line leak detector, you can look for a three gallon per hour leak rate inside the inner pressure piping. Again, we've left the world of kind of static leak testing. This is testing that is done under pressure. Also talked about the electronic line leak detector, similar to the mechanical one. It is looking for a three gallon per hour leak inside the inner pressure piping. However, it can look for, depending on its programming, a three, a 0.2, two Coke can an hour leak, or a 0 0.1, one Coke can an hour leak. You can either have a mechanical or an electronic leak detector. You can't have both, but if you have a pressurized system, it's really critical to know what device you have because you need to know how to respond. If you're getting slow flow, probably got a mechanical leak detector. If you have no flow, then you probably got an electronic line leak detector. And then there's always the option of a 0 0.1 gallon per hour leak test that is done once a year by a service technician. The technician who is certified by the testing manufacturer comes out to your site, isolates the piping, overpressurizes it, looks for a leak, and it's either gonna pass or fail the 0 0.1 gallon per hour leak rate. Now, the one, the, a couple of methods I'm not talking about. In the old days, we had this thing called the tank tightness test, the TTT, and the technician, similar to the last thing with the line test, or so the technician would come in, they'd shut down the system, they'd fill up the tank, and they'd wait for X amount of hours to determine whether or not the tank was leaking. We don't need to do those anymore because the, all these tank methods on the top here, automatic tank gauge and tank interstitial monitoring, do that test. The last time I did this webinar, people were like, well, what about the tank tightness test? Well, that is actually only for if you think you have a leak. So the traditional um, 0 0.1 gallon per hour tank leak test has been substituted by the monthly 0.2 test. You don't need to do an annual tank tightness test as long as you're doing your monthly 0.2 test or your tank interstitial sensor test. The other thing I'm not really covering here is um, inventory control or inventory reconciliation. I know uh, Wisconsin is on the line and a couple other states and uh, some states still do require inventory reconciliation. That, that's beyond the scope of this conversation. It, it's usually kind of a supplement. It's actually fraught with a lot of uh, measurement error. And so what I wanna kind of say in summary about all these methods here, because I used to stick a tank back in 1982 when I was a gas station cashier at a rest area gas stop where there was a mobile and a Howard Johnson's. And I used to stick the tank. I didn't know what I was doing. They're like, yeah, fill out this paperwork and away you go. And so back in the old days when we'd look for leaks, tons of human measurement error. And what these technologies here try to do is reduce the likelihood that you're going to get a false alarm. Measurement error is the interference we introduce when we try to measure something. Uh, me with a stick and I'm 18 years old trying to stick a tank, lots of measurement error. But now I get a automatic tank gauge and it's running a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak test. And it's uh, looking at a fuel liquid measurement of one one thousandth of an inch, super accurate. So all this is all about trying to increase our accuracy so that when we go to bed at night, we can say, yep, I passed a, I solidly passed a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak test. My tanks aren't leaking. I can sleep better at night. <clears throat> 
if you want to learn more about class A, A, we do have a lot more information here with our online uh, class A, B, and C operator training. We have a great webpage, usttrain.com. I do recognize a number of folks who have taken our training on the line here, so I appreciate that. And some of you, have, I think, have even talked to and trained live over the years. I think A, B operators need to know all this stuff, and I'm starting to kind of fold in explanations more like this because it's just... The thing about underground storage tank regulations, there's a whole bunch of ways how to get to the finish line. You can just see these are just the different methods we have for leak detection. And so some of you have a choice about what you do. Some of you have to do certain ones just because of the type of tank system that you have. And so I'm not so much wanted to cover the UST compliance regulations as much as, you know, how we look for leaks and what are some important signals to look for. And I do want to throw in a couple other pro tips at the end here. They're not exactly related to leak detection, but um, if anyone's on the line here who is a certified class AB operator, you have to do your monthly or your 30 day walkthrough inspections. And the idea is that now when you walk around a site once a month, you can find things that you might otherwise miss. And I've done a number of live training classes this year, and I've trained a bunch of operators who are supposedly doing the monthly walkthrough inspection. You go out to a site, and there's all this stuff that's like not being documented. I've re recently saw a disabled sensor and a, a spill bucket with a cracked drain valve. And so those are like, I mean, those are problems, right? And so you really want to take this information that I talked about leak detection, you have to fold it into your 30 day practice. Some of you are actually inspecting the tanks every single day. If you're a super busy site, you might be needing to inspect more often than every 30 days. So please document through your 30 day walkthrough inspections and please document and fix those problems. Another thing I wanna point about is that you do need to respond to all alarms. I have seen a great improvement of people responding to alarms. So the alarm is going off and if you don't know what it means, I mean, our, our joke with a class C training is if you're a class C operator and it's blinking red, call your boss. It's, it's not a lot more complicated than that. And so you have to respond to all alarms. You can't say, oh, that old alarm or, you know, that happened after the technician left, or this happens all the time, or I didn't even know what that means, or some people hide the tank mantra, they put tape over it and don't want to see the red alarm or muffle the, 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 the audible alarm. You simply have to respond to all alarms. You have to take all alarms seriously. It is a violation if you don't respond, but, you know, who wants to have an ignored alarm and fuel leaking into the ground? That, hopefully, hopefully nobody here. I am gonna be doing a webinar in a couple of weeks with my friends at VitaRoot. If you have a VitaRoot TLS 350, this is very important. The VitaRoot TLS 300, 350 series is going away. VitaRoot is gonna quit uh, servicing them, gonna quit supporting them in the next couple of years. We have a couple of years to kind of figure this out. I recently was told by someone though that there's a back order on the latest uh, TLS 450 plus models. And so just know that the VitaRoot tank monitor that I'm talking about here, which I've been told there's a quarter million units of them out there in the US, uh, it is going away. And it's actually going away for a lot of good reasons. And if you stick around and, and hear a webinar presentation from VitaRoot in a couple of weeks, you'll get a better sense about like why that is, uh, what's behind that. I won't steal their thunder here, but I, I think it's a really good move. Um, but it is gonna cost people money. It's gonna be a little bit of a frustration. If you have any spare VitaRoot parts, hold on them. They're gonna be worth gold and, and not too long from now. And lastly, I wanna say have an exceptional record keeping system. I know uh, Maryland, I've got a whole bunch of uh, inspectors on the line here. You guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, underground storage tank operations create a lot of paperwork and your ability to be a great operator really uh, hinges on you keeping a great record keeping system. If you have a ton of tanks out there, it's a big job. You're tracking all sorts of uh, uh, conditions for maybe all sorts of sites, maybe even all sorts of states. I think I have a couple of uh, national providers on the line here today. You have to keep good records. If you're corporate, you're managing, you're creating a really smart record keeping system. If you're a mom and pop or single tank operator, it's all about keeping that binder and keeping all this information straight. So again, do your monthly walkthrough inspections, keep an eye on those alarms. If you've got a TLS 350, which you probably do if you're on this call, uh, stay tuned for more details and please keep really good records. Whew. Okay, well, that's kind of all I got. I just wanted to cover, again, the leak methods, uh, the equipment that runs them, what kind of leak tests that they run, how do they run the leak tests and what sort of signal do they get? Your mission now is that is to figure out, okay, so I've got, a single wall tank with a pressurized line, a mechanical line leak detector. So what kind of things am I to look for? Um, 
the frustrating and kind of challenging thing about explaining UST rules is that everyone's got a little bit of a different site, right? We've got generator tank people on the line here. We have um, we have large uh, corporate chains and kind of everything in between here. And so it's absolutely critical you know the type of equipment that you have at your location. And so if you want to learn more about your underground tanks, you haven't seen our YouTube video series, please feel free to go to www.youtube.com and, and learn more. But that's kind of all I got. I'm at 40 minutes to the hour. And um, Matt, if you can kind of help me jump in here, what sort of questions have I, have I been missing along the way? Yeah, let's look through some of the Q&A here, see if we can do some follow-up answers. Uh, looks like, uh, let's get back to the top here. Okay, so uh, Josh Schroeder asks, if the ATG reads a leak, uh, rate of less than 0.1 gallons per hour, should that be cause for concern? I mean, and, and, and any any leak, any failed leak test is cause for concern. If your tank gauge, and you can program your tank gauge to look for a smaller leak, you have to control the conditions a lot more. If you have a tank gauge leak test rate of 0.1 gallon per hour, that is a suspected release and must be investigated. Normally that's only done once a year. Um, and it's not common to see kind of routinely, but yeah, so you can find a two Coke can ga gallon per hour leak, but if you find a one Coke can gallon per hour leak, yes, it's below the minimum threshold, but it is a suspected release. And then uh, uh, Baz Langley um, asks, um, I'm, I'm not sure at what point he asked this, but he says, is, is this in relation to pressure systems or suction or both? And then he says, sorry, I, I've just seen it as for pressure. So that's that's a good point that, that um, sometimes this applies to, to just one. Correct. And so if you only have suction piping, I didn't really get into that whole thing, but if you only have suction piping, most of this is not going to apply. It, if you don't have the right type of suction piping, you may have to have double wall piping, which was the interstitial discussion we talked about. Oh, Vicky's here. Okay, good. Yep. Ben, and then, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so Ben, can you speak for the need of having an electronic line leak detector properly set up? Oh, okay. So you're... Vicky's from Wisconsin. I did a tank inspection years ago in Wisconsin. They had 300 feet of pipe. I mean, like the tank was here and the piping was way across the property over there. And what it turns out is that the leak detector was only certified for 150 feet of pipe length. After that, it's like, we can't guarantee this information is accurate. What somebody, some smarty pants contractor did is that they cut the length of the pipe in half on the programming. <laughs> and so it, it was passing a leak test, but it was not correct. And so um, when you have an electronic line leak detector, it has to be programmed for the pipe diameter, pipe length and pipe type. If you have flexible plastic piping, it takes a bit more for stuff to stabilize. And so thank you for that, Vicki. So, um, you can't just put an electronic line leak detector in and expect it to kind of work. It has to be spec to the conditions, which is why once a year now, your tank gauge has to be certified by a, the vendor uh, certified technician to make sure the program settings are correct. We are finding lots of settings that were kind of tweaked in favor of the operator, but kind of at the expense of the environment. That, that, thank you for that, Vicki. And yes, that, that, thank you again for uh, uh, supporting uh, Steve's vision. He's, he, he's greatly missed. see what's the next question uh, a couple of a couple of smaller points down here below um ellen make asks uh, a brine liquid sensor can go into a alarm if level rises or drops correct uh, th that is correct i mean if it's if it's if it's dropping right let me think about this if it's dropping then the outer chamber is probably leaking if it's rising maybe there's a hole inside the tank so it's it's not so much about just dropping, it's a, it's a change in condition. And I've been told sometimes uh, due to a number of factors that are not a leak, the, 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 the liquid will kind of fluctuate a little bit. So it's allowed a certain amount of tolerance, but if you're like really losing a lot of liquid or really gaining a lot of liquid, it will go into alarm. It is for up or down. Baz also mentions that he's looking forward to the next TLS 350 webinar. I, I bet that's going to be a popular uh, yes. topic. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, sign up early, please. We we're, yeah. we st we still have about 100 or some seats left. Yeah, feel free to sign up right away. 
Robin West asks, what would you recommend as key components in the monthly walkthrough inspection you mentioned with regards to the UST itself? Robin, that's a great question. So there's kind of two answers. There's, there's what I would recommend, which is a PEI, Petroleum Equipment Institute, has a monthly walkthrough inspection that is exhaustive. It's a great walkthrough inspection. That being said, um, each state's a little bit differently. We're, we are pretty current with our collection of monthly I'm sorry, of, of our different state monthly walkthrough inspection forms. So first off, you have to satisfy whatever jurisdiction you're in. It is largely looking at the tank top pads. And so you're checking all these openings to make sure that there's no problem there. You're also checking the condition of your automatic tank gauge. So it's pretty much limited to the tank top and the tank gauge. Maybe some states do require you to check uh, at your dispenser or underneath your dispenser. So um I mean, think about it as things that are readily easy to inspect. And you may even have to open up your containment sump lid if you don't have a sump sensor in there because there's no way to tell if there's a leak in there. So it's tank top inspections. I do have a YouTube video. Actually, Matt, you shot the video footage for that up in, um, for the uh, uh, Swinomish uh, tribe up in Washington. So I've got a great how to do a monthly walkthrough inspection. I will caution by saying it does kind of vary a little bit jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In my mind, if you use RP900, you're covering that and a whole lot more. They talk about record keeping and certifying operators and checking your dispensers and stuff like that. So in my mind, as much as humanly possible that is safe to do, bearing in mind that certain jurisdictions require XYZ different than, than what the feds do. And also, of course, things vary quite a bit from site to site. So what's included in that video that we, that we shot at that particular UST location is not likely to apply to 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 your situation. So. Yes, and that and that was oh, and uh, site safety. Matt's filming me doing this uh, inspection training video, and this guy with a bicycle comes bombing into our into. Our, remember that Matt? This guy comes by with a bicycle, like in between me and the cones, and he's like, he doesn't care. <laughs> he's going to go through. So when you're doing your monthly with, with an open lid and everything, so yeah. <laughs> So when you're doing your inspections, assume someone's going to creep up behind you with a bicycle and knock you in a pit. Just, just, just really be be careful about that. Okay, good. Um, oh, uh, uh, Bill Combs asked about tank gauges can find leaks in manifolded tanks. They normally have to be valved off to separate the two tanks so that the test will run properly. So you want to make if your tanks are manifolded, you want to make sure your tank gauge is certified for those manifoldings. Or there is a physical or an electronic way to isolate those because you can't you can't test them together they have to be separated and each tank is measured separately are there limits to uh the the, the number of manifolded tanks uh are, are there practical limits that that ATGs um run up against with manifolded tanks or or uh, at, uh, I seem I, to remember something about up to a certain size uh, yeah well yeah there 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 are certain limits to which a tank gauge will function if the tank is too big, but uh, normally it's two tanks manifolded together. I, I don't know if I've ever seen more, maybe at like giant truck stops, there might be- That's what I was thinking manifolds. of, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It, yeah, so it's normally two identical sized tanks that are manifolded together and they should have the exact same volume in each tank because as, as it drains down, it's pulling from both tanks. We do need to isolate those um, to do that. But I think, I think if you're doing CSLD testing, you don't have to isolate the manifold. I have to double check on that. Okay. A couple of questions, uh, a couple more questions at the bottom here. Uh, Marlon Alcantara uh, asks, uh, when do you think the use of VitaRoot TLS, 50, for, um, TLS 450 will be implemented and approximately how much the system uh, will cost? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, they've quit making the 350. So as of today, they're not making any new ones. No, no, no new ones are being born. <laughs> and so um, I've been told that support is going to shut off in the next five, I think it was five years. But I think that's been actually cut back because with COVID, there's been a distrib uh, distribution chain snag. Parts are getting hard to find. So I mean, my kind of informal prediction is probably in the next three years, it's going to get it's going to get tough for us to find them. What the cost is, I don't know. I, I do know that the probes and the sensors, if they're reasonably modern, should be able to maintain in place. You don't have to change out all the parts, just the just the box that talks to all the sensors. And so um, so long as you have a reasonably contemporary system, your floats and your sensors do not have to be changed. What the cost is, uh, it's probably going to be the big question for the Vitaroot um uh, webinar in a couple of weeks. I'd say stay tuned for details on that. 
And then Marlon also has a question, how frequently the operator needs to do leak detection? Is it monthly or twice a month? Marlon, that's a case where when we talk about underground storage tank questions and we get them all the time, the answer almost starts off, well, Marlon, it depends. <laughs> it really right. depends on a lot of things. Um, at a minimum, if you have a single wall tank, at a minimum, you have to do a leak test every 30 days. 0 0.2 gallon per leak test every 30 days. If you have a double wall tank, you're doing leak detection 24 seven, 365. So it kind of doesn't matter. So the minimum would be proving it every 30 days. If you have piping, you're continuously doing pressurized catastrophic leak detection for a three gallon per hour leak. If you have a interstitial sensor, then you're doing it continuously, but reporting monthly. And if you have an annual line tightness test, it's once a year. So the answer is gonna be at a minimum every 30 days for the tank and the lines, continuous for the pressurized piping. And there are some exceptions for that annually. So I don't, Mar Marlon, I'd almost have to get your particular tank configuration to give you an exact answer. But again, it, 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 it kind of depends. And then a couple couple other folks have raised some points in, in regard to what we were talking about previously. Um, Ellen Mank says, uh, CSLD can be used for manifold tanks without closing siphon, but I believe there's a total capacity limit listed on NWGLDE. Correct, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, thank you, Ellen. I thought that was the case. So if your tanks are, if the total capacity of both tanks is under 30,000 gallons, I think you're okay, but if you got, two giant monster, I don't know, 20, 25, 30,000 gallon tanks that may exceed that. So yes, you can do manifolding leak detection with CSLD to a point. Uh, thank you for that. These are always interesting talks. I kind of start off general, but I don't you know, know who's gonna be on the call. Well, suddenly we start getting into some really deep and good uh, questions. So that's great. And then uh, Baz Langley uh, pointing out that in the UK, the UK has a legal 10 year support, but we've been installing now for the last few years. I, I, I'm guessing that's related to the TLS uh, 350. 350, okay, okay. I'm dying to get over to the UK and see what the tanks look like, Baz. So maybe I can, maybe I can look you up someday. And then I look, uh, Ellen Mank said, uh, increase frequency of uh, ATG static leak detector test to ensure, yes, yes. So yes, you could do a, every 30 days, 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak test. But you know what? If your tank is nearly empty on the day you go to test and you've missed a whole month's time. So the smarter operators who have to do a periodic static uh, 0.2 test, test more frequently. So I would encourage anyone to be testing at least weekly. That way you'll always, you'll be reasonably sure the tank is full enough to get a valid passing test. One thing I didn't kind of tied into this, if you're doing a static leak detection test on the tank, the tank has to be at least 50% full. With CSLD, you don't need to worry about tank volume, but if you only have periodic testing, you always have to be managing your fuel level so there's enough fuel in the tank to get a passing test. What's the greatest number of USTs you have seen in one facility? Well, I've had the good fortune, for better or worse, of being inside uh, the Red Hill tanks in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I'll tell you, being inside a 13 million gallon underground concrete tank that's inside a volcano is kind of crazy making. I mean, it's a big, big tank. So the biggest capacity I've ever been into, there is a gas station that the Navy operates in uh, Pearl Harbor, and it's a it's a quarter of a billion gallon capacity. That It's because there's 20... 13 million gallon tanks. That's a big system. Um, probably I've gone to a number of military bases over the years. And back in the old days, they would have hundreds and hundreds of tanks per location. Um, so as far as facility goes, it's usually military. Um, they're making some truck stops these days that are massive. I mean, there's truck stops that have, I don't know, 10, 20 tanks out there. And so I just can't imagine doing a monthly walkthrough inspection there. So the, the, the big, busy truck stops, um, and the military bases probably have the biggest kind of uh, aggregate capacity in individual tanks. I'll, uh, I'll put a link in the Q&A uh, to a, a news article on our site uh, about the Red Hill tanks where you can see a, a, a little bit more information about uh, the scale of that engineering project. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Baz. Okay, okay. Um, 
that's kind of all I got. Any more questions before we round it off to the top of the hour? I will be making this available on YouTube for my my great operators out uh, out in the deep South Pacific. I'll make this available on YouTube so you don't have to get up at four in the morning next time to watch it again. Any more questions before we wrap it up? I encourage you all to you know keep your eyes open, ask questions. Um, Every tank system's a little bit different. What, if you're an inspector, you've got to keep track of a whole bunch of different uh, systems out there. You might be a single operator with a single tank and it's it's kind of straightforward, but I think, and again, I'm kind of carrying Steve Papora's message, we have to know how this stuff works. I mean, yeah, there's compliance and yeah, there's regulations, but the best operators I know are the ones who kind of understand how all this stuff works. If you know how it works, now you know why it's so important to have a, a um a leak test done right so back in the old days back when uh when underground tanks kind of became like a national disaster problem the majority of tanks were leaking i mean there were there was they look at all these fittings and openings and there's just all sorts of room for leaks to go on um the leak rates have plummeted now down to i've seen as low as one percent are actively leaking now maybe as high as five percent but if you you know, you get 100 tank operators in the room, there's probably a leaker among you that doesn't even know it because the leak is so small or the signal's being missed or the technology is offline or there are you know, a variety of reasons to why we still have leaks, but the leaks are still out there, folks. And yes, we've gotten better, but we have to now keep up our vigilance. We've got better monitoring systems. We have better electronic devices. We've got remote monitoring. There's a lot of great things here, but you know, trust your gut, use your common sense, respond to alarms. I guess that's I'll leave it at that. Oh, Bill Combs did ask a uh, wireless uh, uh, electronic line leak detectors. For a while, there were electronic line leak detectors that didn't have a direct power line going to them. They use a wireless signal. They're, they're not really popular anymore. It turns out the signal from the fluorescent lights of the canopy were kind of interrupting the signal. And so the, the signal degradation was serious. So if you ever see a WPLLD, wireless uh, pressurized line leak detector test, it's pro it probably ought to be replaced with a more contemporary one. I, I wonder if he's, I uh, wonder if Bill's asking more generally just about pressurized line leak de detectors and not distinguishing between ex internal and external. Um, I'm not, because maybe maybe saying W, oh and, with 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 P L L D, yeah, I, yeah. I've not heard of wireless P L L D. That's that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I misinterpreted the W there. Yeah. So you, I'm not sure, Bill. If you're asking kind of like from a compliance angle, or you might need to flesh out your 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 question a little bit more, uh, Eric. I will. Um, is is it an interstitial uh, line? Is that is that maybe um, what's being asked? Or like yeah, or like if, yeah, or like if you have a if you have a PLLD, do you have to do double wall piping? It, 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 I I think I know where that's going, Bill. I, I'd say call, call me after this. I'm happy to answer a particular question, but um, I do want to kind of wrap it up here. Um, um, uh, Eric, there will be copies of this available. I'll put it up on YouTube. And Matt, if you can help remind me, we can send out a thank you letter and give everyone a link. It should be up yep. late, later today, hopefully. Yeah, we'll, we'll get the recording uh, link and then we'll send that out to, to all the attendees. So you'll, you'll receive a recording of this if you want to uh, yeah. keep a copy or, or share it. Thank, thanks, Matt. So yeah, we love talking about tanks. If you've ever got a USD question, uh, give us a call. If you have a goofy picture of some uh, funny underground tank scenario, please send it to us. We use it for our uh, our famous uh, What's Wrong With This Picture newsletter. And our newsletter went out today. So be on the lookout for uh, this, this month's What's Wrong With This Picture. I think we can cut it from there. Oh, no, I'm, I'm recording. Hold on. There you go. Yeah. <laughs>